as you all undoubtedly know, there are only three permitted ingredients in Scotch whisky. There's water, there's a cereal base that could be barley or corn or wheat, even oats or rye, and there's yeast. Just the three ingredients. There's no enzymes, there's no additives, there's no flavourings, just that. There is another ingredient, however, and that's the ingredient of tradition. Because a great weight has always been put on Scotch whisky and this idea of Scotch whisky that it has been made essentially in the same way since time immemorial. Tradition is all important. And yet, as Arthur and I uncover different accounts and different recipes, the, all this assumption about this unchanging tradition is increasingly challenged. Bob, it would appear, is one of those. A lost tradition which probably wouldn't even be permitted today because it isn't traditional. So this word bub, it was a word largely unfamiliar to me when I came across it in the 1823 Excise Act for research for the first liquid antiquarian episode. The 1823 Excise Act, of course, is this seminal piece of legislation that laid the foundations for really the birth of the Scotch whisky industry in the 19th century and laid the framework for really well into the 20th century. So there it was in this act, repeated a number of times, bub, bub, bub. But it was not properly explained exactly what it was. It seemed to be something that was made and used at the fermentation stage. Uh, it was something permitted in certain amounts by the government. It seemed to be a process as much as an ingredient or as well as an ingredient. I was intrigued and kept searching. I saw references here and there of later use as here in 1897, where it is discussed in terms of problem or stuck fermentations. And then into the 20th century, where it is more or it was more often associated with grain distilleries, for example, at Cast Bridge. And there was even some references within modern legislation. So I asked a, a few knowledgeable people I knew, distillers, writers, um, and no one really gave me a satisfactory answer. There was a little bit about what bub could be in a modern sense but really no answers about what bub could have been in the 1820s in a Scotch single malt pot still distillery. Now, Dave, you were actually one of the few people who did come up with a good answer and, and had some reference to bub in modern times. I first came across something very similar to, to bub and, and bubbing yeast uh, when I went to Kentucky to look at bourbon distilleries and most bourbon distilleries have their own yeast strains and they, they essentially grow their own yeast uh, within the distillery itself. And to grow it, they use something which is called a, a dona, D-O-N-A tub. And that essentially is exactly the same as, as Bob. It's, it's growing the yeast, building it in volume and building it in strength before it can be pitched in, into the ferment. I've subsequently seen uh, Bob tanks in Irish distilleries and Japanese distilleries and uh, Invergordon runs a kind of adapted bubbing system still. Uh, it was certainly used in Dumbarton Distillery as well. So it was a technique that, that was and actually continues to be used, but in a slightly different way. So it's like the technique is, has, has shifted somewhat. So I'm beginning to wonder, you know, when did it change and why did it change? And in those investigations, I went back to uh, a couple of, of books which are instructions for excise officers one from 1911, one from 1938. And in both of them, bub is mentioned and also how to measure bub, uh, what the strength should be, when it should be used, when it can be used, when it can't be used. So it was very much part and parcel of distillation practice. Otherwise it wouldn't be in these books. So we have bub continuing to be used in Scotland, but probably changing and moving away from whiskey distilled in pot stills at low strength to being distilled in column stills at high strength. Where let's be honest, the flavour effect or possible flavour effect of bub would be hidden. So we kind of feared that we would never actually find out what this bub stuff was, at least the bub of the 1820s. But 
Then, one happy afternoon, I was up at the house of Charlie McLean, whiskey writer, um, performance poet, record-breaking father of sons, and all-round wonderful good egg and boiler of eggs. And in this wonderful library, there it was up on the shelf. I was having a dram and pulled this down. This intriguing, slim volume, published in 1828 in Elgin and written by an excise man called John MacDonald. In short, it is a guide for good practice for distillers. There's also advice for other people in the alcohol industry, but a large amount of it is good practice for whiskey distillers. So this is a man in the right place at the right time. Elgin, the heart of Speyside. This is the excise collection town for, uh, for the Speyside area. And of course, this is one of the most famous areas that made this transition from illicit distillation to legal distillation. So if there were old practices from the past, chances are this is one of those places where it would survive. He's also worked in many distilleries. You can kind of tell from the way it's written, he's seen many ways of making whiskey in many different places. And there's a foreword from his bosses who say how experienced he is. So he describes lots of different ways of making whiskey in great detail. And there it was. Not only a mention of Bub, but a recipe, a method of application, everything total jackpot. I was so happy. Let's have a look at it. So it starts with a why. Why use bub? Why is it sometimes necessary? And a little bit of a definition as well on bub and directions for making it. Distillers can hardly carry on the process of fermentation without some sweet Scotch yeast, which costs a very high price, but much less of it than is generally used would do, were they to substitute bub principally in its place, and would be a great point of economy and saving, as it is a thing that can be easily made at every distillery with very little expense, for by making this composition, fermentation might be carried on with it, and the assistance of English balm, without being always at the expense of buying sweet yeast from breweries. For every distiller could preserve as much sweet yeast from the fermenting wash as would be sufficient to make bub, which is all that would be required for starting and exciting the wort to ferment, in preparatory to the English balm being added, or at all events by using one eighth gallon of sweet balm in making the bub, and afterwards adding a gallon and a fourth of English yeast. For every 100 gallons of wort at 50 pounds of gravity, the fermentation should be carried on to perfection by even an ordinary good management. Bub may be simply made by boiling some wort and hops together for about 40 minutes, then cooled to about 80 degrees of temperature and adding some sweet yeast to it. Okay, so hops. Hops. Now, immediately we have an ingredient here that would not be permitted for use in the production of Scotch whiskey today if you wanted to legally call it Scotch whiskey. So that's immediately fascinating. I really love that recipe. The, the detail in it is so amazing. And yet at the same time, you know, when you begin to look at it, it not all the questions are answered. There, there are still some elements that aren't quite fully explained. I mean, why are hops used to begin with? And that's one that really kind of leaps out at you to begin with. Uh, and you do wonder whether they're there for flavouring purposes. Uh, you know, does the distiller want to have that kind of hoppy, acidic quality coming through in the final spirit? Or are they there for antibacterial purposes to stop any spoilage taking place uh, during the ferment? I kind of tend to, to go towards that latter explanation that, you know, it's to, it's to prevent any bad bacteria uh, beginning to infect the ferment. But who knows, you know, maybe some, some flavour did sneak through uh, in the final spirit. What is sweet Scotch yeast? Uh, and, and what's sweet about it? Uh, and why is it Scotch? So th th that really isn't explained, and that's really particularly intriguing for me, as is the very specific mention of English barm. 
as against Scottish barm. Now, barm is the, the, the froth that gathers on top of a, a fermenter when you're making beer. And that was always gathered and then dried uh, and then used as a yeast starter for, for the next ferment. Well, why English barm? Uh, because there's breweries in Scotland. So there must have been something specific about the way in which barm was made in England uh, that allowed it to be given it this special designation. Thankfully, MacDonald actually does give us the recipe for English barm. So let's have a look at it. So MacDonald starts with a definition of barm. Balm or yeast is the macaligonous, 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 macaligonous substance or scum, which rises on the top of liquor containing saccharine matter after the vinous fermentation having commenced. His recipe for balm. To make balm, take four gallons of water at about 90 degrees of temperature and 80 pounds of gravity and a quarter of a gallon of molasses or two pounds of sugar, then mix both together until the treacle or sugar, as the case may be, is fairly dissolved among the wort. After which you will add a bottle of the bottom of a hogshead of porter or four bottles of porter and a six penny loaf of bread broken down in small crumbs. Then mix a whole together till it is a little agitated and set it at 75 degrees of temperature in a warm place where the thermometer stands at 80 degrees and the liquor will be in a fair state of fermentation within four hours, which quantity of fermentable matter will be sufficient to start 500 gallons of wort, which can afterwards be carried on by an addition of English yeast. But the best method is to add a gallon of English balm to the said quantity of fermentable matter about an hour before it is to be put into the wort set for fermentation. So there we have it. Porter, uh, six penny loaves of bread and English balm. The recipe certainly intrigues and the recipe pulls away, reveals some, some idea of how whiskey was being made at the beginning of the 19th century. Something we always assume we know, but actually the more you look, the, the less we actually do understand. So it's very useful in, in that particular aspect. But what actually intrigues me even more is the way in which it might actually give some ideas as to how whiskey was made prior to this. And that is a, a lot more murky. There's less clear cut information about these older whiskies. Because what you have to remember is that in 1823, scale is imposed upon the whole of the Scotch whisky industry. And an older way of making whisky simply ceases to exist. That older way is small scale distillation by farms, by private individuals, making their whisky, making their broust once a year in small quantities. All of a sudden, as distilleries get bigger, more yeast is needed, it becomes more expensive and it's scarce. That's all what this recipe is about. So the recipe is a, is a solution to a problem, but maybe within that recipe and kind of be between the lines of the recipe is this idea that some of the techniques which are being used are actually much older ones. The use of hops, for example, perhaps the use of hops is similar to the use of heather in, in old beers, who knows? Was this Bob recipe an adaptation of even older ways of working? Is it solution? Was it tradition? And to reiterate this point about how recent the use of bub is, Dave, you actually looked somewhere where I should have looked at the beginning, actually. I'm kicking myself I didn't. <laughs> so I looked at G.E. Nettleton's account of uh, Scotch whisky production, uh, which came out in 1913. And there in the section of yeast preparation, there's two recipes for making a bub, one of which is pretty much identical to that of McDonald's. Now, McDonald's was almost 90 years previous. So does that mean that this way of making bub continued throughout the 19th century as the Scotch whisky industry grew in strength and importance and scale? Was this form of bub the original tradition or not. And underneath all of it, what effect did it have on flavour? Well, 
What effect on flavour indeed. Dave and I both thought immediately that it was time to put some bub in a wash bag, see what effect it had, taste it, then distill it and taste it again to bring bub back to life, to make a bubbed whiskey. So I spoke to my colleague Mark Watson at Holyrood Distillery and Nick Ravenhall, two of the most fun, knowledgeable, historically aware distillers working in Scotland today. We showed them the book, we asked if they were interested, and they did not hesitate for a second. Let's make bub. Arthur. We are here at Holyrood Distillery, and today we're going to make that bub. Shall we? Let's do it. Thank you. <laughs> Did you just teleport in? Yes. Yeah, I'm still a bit kind of phased yeah, by the whole phased. thing. Yeah. Well, let's go and, go and make some bub. Cool. cool. Character. It's good walking, though. <laughs> Right, what have we got? So we got two things here. First thing we've got, and this is for last night's mash. Uh, so this is uh, the first runnings of the wort from this evening. And uh, the reason why it's up here is this is the base. This is what we need to make the bub. We, this is the, one of the prime ingredients of it. So what we'll do tonight is we'll load this into the pilot still. Um, we'll then add in our hops with it and then we'll boil that for 40 minutes. Okay. Uh, and then we're doing it tonight because we need it to cool overnight for us to use it tomorrow morning. So it's too hot when we take it out of the pilot still tonight, we let it cool overnight and in the morning when you come in, you'll add the yeast to it and that'll start the bub being created. Great. And even as a just the, the, to use this as the base, the smell of it is this, unbelievable. Yeah, it's so thick and bready, and ah, and it, it it already smells. Can I taste it? Yeah, you can taste it. Yeah, it's hot. It's just be careful. It already smells so thick in texture. And it's it's really sweet, but it is really bready. Yeah. It has this like weird creaminess to it as well that I, I really like. From Chevalier. From the Chevalier, yeah. Um, and so when this goes in with the, the hops, we're gonna boil it for 40 minutes. That texture is only gonna increase because we're obviously gonna lose some of that water. It's gonna be more syrupy. Mm -hmm. um, so once it's all cooled down, I'll be really interested to see it tomorrow morning when it's had, had the yeast in it. It's yeah, of course, I hadn't thought about that. Its volume is gonna reduce it's going to be concentrated. Yeah. How much do you think it's going to reduce by? Mm, I'd say probably a third. I reckon oh, a third. It's quite a lot. Yeah. If you think about cooking down a sauce on the stove. Yeah. That's so I'd quite a lot. be really interested to see how much comes out of it. So we've got slightly more than we need in here just be because of that. Yeah. Um, and we're, we'll, we'll use that tomorrow to create the bub mash. Great. Should we pump it in then? Yeah, let's do it. Carl, oh, can I press the button? Yeah, you push <laughs> So just, it's just a sideways. Huh? There we go. Oh. Is it finished? Yes. <laughs> so when we were looking at this project, first of all, we spoke about who we could possibly get to make the bub. And we were concerned about people having to use extra equipment, but then when we mentioned it to you straight away, you said we could use this old gin still in place of a bub copper, which is what is mentioned a number of times. But of course, it's been totally cleaned out, so there's no residual gin smell at all. Yeah. 
Yeah, Connor was on it this week, cleaning it out so that we have something that's like totally fresh that we're just, when we boil it, like want to obviously get that, I mean, copper interaction, whether that makes a difference with it or not, but it'd be really interesting to, when we, when we add the hops to it, what we get. Not only from a, Mm. Uh, from the concentrated flavour, but also from the water runoff when it comes across the still when we boil it, and what that what that'll taste like as well. Yeah, okay, I didn't think of that actually. So they're mentioning above copper. Do they? Th- do you think they're thinking about that? What alternative would they have had? Just a big pot, just a just like Could a just like a, a, yeah, a okay. mash tun, like a Caledonian style mash tun of just like a big pot with a with a hat on the top of it that runs back in probably. Sure. But this is our nearest equivalent, so. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's great. And I, we're glad you didn't have to buy any extra equipment yeah. on our behalf. Should we add some hops then? Yes, let's add some hops. So we had a good chat about which type of hop to use, which species of hop. And I bow to your historical knowledge, actually. Yeah, so when we were when we were first discussing it, I think I'd uh, originally suggested um, Fuggle, uh, and then we did some further digging into it, you and I, about the the age of which Father Fuggle was first bred, and it is actually past the age of Bub. Um, however, doing some further digging, we we found that East Kent Goldings is the oldest UK. Uh, hop variety or one of the oldest UK hop variety and therefore would have been more prevalent in this uh, in the era of, of bulb and production and certainly used the Goldings hop was used all across the UK as well uh-huh. um, so when we're talking about bulb production at Holyrood you know ho- you know Goldings would have been used um, in the local Holyrood breweries and, and the, the Edinburgh breweries as well being one of the one of the, the key sort of British grown hops of its time. And in terms of character, I mean, they smell amazing. Yeah. In terms of character, uh, we, we have to think of them as not like a modern hop, which is, for want of a better word, super hoppy. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, in, in, in the parlance of a modern beer drinker. Yeah. So this, I think, would be, you know, used in your more, you know, traditional 80 shilling and your, uh-huh. you know, they're, they're a much more gentle hop, both in terms of alpha acids and also flavor contribution. And you get this spicy earthiness with them. And there's a little bit of fruit uh, that goes along with it. And obviously you're getting all that. There's a lot of sort of herbal flavors coming off the bag as we're putting it out there as well. Yeah, amazing. Um, but they're then, like... Uh, they're, they're fruity, but it's not that ultra grapefruity yeah. fruitiness that you get in a modern hop to me. Yeah, it's, it's more like a fruit of the forest kind of berry. I think you've hit the nail on the head with berry. I think it's definitely a sort of like a blackberry or, or some sort of like berry that you would find like at the side of a road or something like that. Like it's, um, it's a much more subtle sort of fruitiness that goes along with it. And you say it was used at the old Holyrood brewery but is this the first time hops have been in the building uh, ver- yeah as far as i'm aware it's the first time we've used <laughs> used hops hops in, in in the brewery um in the distillery sorry and yeah i think it's really exciting for us this project i think it just it just gives us a, a different avenue where uh of that that historical influence and of things that kind of came in and out of fashion in spirit production uh-huh. um and I think we we're there? almost we're almost there. Yeah, well, I was frustrated not knowing what bub was, and then when I found the recipe, I was like, "Oh, great! I found the recipe. I can answer that question." And when I saw the word hops, that was when I got really excited that something needs to be done with this. Yeah, it, it, because it instantly, any whiskey fan who knows a little bit about how it's made. The word hops just, you know, blows your mind. You've got to, you've got to find out what that tastes like. And it's just amazing to think that at the birth of whiskey, they were using hops. Yeah. So uh, this is the most exciting element in many ways. Yeah, very much so. So do you think they were using it from a, or microbiological perspective and a sterilization or a um, preservative thing that, that, you know, hops were known for in beer at the time? 
I was going to ask you the same question. Um, well, yeah, my, my opinion is probably yes. Sterilisation, yeah. Sterilisation yeah. and, and, and that's what longevity. They, yeah, and the fact that they've got no fridges. They've got yep. a concern about temperature control. They've got a concern, presumably, about um, mashes spoiling. Yep. And they have less tools than you would do as a modern distiller in terms of controlling temperature. So hops, presumably, as sterilization. But it seemed like quite a lot of hops relative to the liquid. Yeah. Again, you're the expert on this, but that was my first instinct. And that's why we've got to make it and find out. Yeah, I, I, do, I do think it's quite, quite a lot of hops. And I'm, uh, especially because you're concentrating it, you're boiling it with, and it's getting smaller, and we're, we're creating that concentrated, uh, the, the bub with the wort. So I think just really interested in to see what comes out of the bub alone, as opposed to just, let alone what's going to happen with the spirit. I'd be really excited just to taste the bub alone. And I've learned so many new words in this process of this project as well. Like, well, bub for one, barm for another one. Yeah. Um, Muckaliganus. <laughs> Muckaliganus. <laughs> you, you knew Muckaliganus. <laughs> I didn't know Muckaliganus. Uh, I don't even know if I'm saying it right. Um, okay. How many are we looking for? We're looking for five kilos. So that is half. So we're going to need another bag. Really? Yeah. <laughs> we'll fill this one a bit quicker. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realise we're doing two. Yeah. Well, I thought we'd all get it into one, so we'll, we'll, I didn't quite appreciate that we were going to get. It oh. was going to fill so much. So. Well, we can tip a bag in each. Then. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Right, I'll go and grab another bag. <laughs> Here's our bag of hops. Would you, would you like to do the honors? Cheers. Yeah, cheers. There you go. <laughs> would you like to do the honors? Yeah, I'll go first. Oof. Sploosh. There you go. Just make sure it's nice and tight. There we go. Are they going to sink? Yeah, they'll sink. They'll start to soak up the moisture and then they'll sink to the bottom. Lovely. I'll give, a, give them a little dunk. As per the book, after 12 hours, you should prepare the English ale yeast for pitching. So for staying true to that, um, this is the English ale yeast in the bucket, it's propagating just now. And we'll add this into the mash that had no bub. Mm -hmm. So this will be the controls. So the only thing that we change in it is adding the bub and no bub. Right. And so this is the no bub yeast. Right, got it. And then this drum mm -hmm. is the bub yeast. Right. So you can see it's super active. Oh my God, that's amazing. Savory. Really savory. Yeah. It smells, like, like, smells like browning mints. It does smell a bit like browning mints. It's, um, it's got this weird herbal note Aye. to yeah. it as well. Um, and so what we're doing with this now is the wort's running through the lines, mash is on, and we'll add this into the yeast pitcher, turn it on, and the bub, that's it, gone. It's in. Perfect. How exciting. I've pulled a sample. Already, so we can taste it on its own. We've got to taste it in the bucket. I can't wait. Yeah. I can't wait. That is just so alive, isn't it? Yeah. Incredible. And that yeah. uses the, the well, that uses the barm in there as well, so there's, there's more solid things around the edges you can kind of yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's the barm which is the, from the last batch. Were you expecting it to kick off as no. intensely as that? No. Yeah. No. When we have it in here, Normally, you know, we make it up maybe about half an hour beforehand. And there's a game that the distiller's play, and that is, uh, we'll leave it to as long until the bubbles reach the top and no more, because then it's as active as it's going to be. I think we would have made a mess if we left this for any length of time. So active, so fast. So uh, it's really interesting. I suppose it goes in with the concentration, the boiling of the, mm -hmm. the bubble makes more sugar. So. Yeah, and it's not a great surprise, I suppose, yeah. but it's, it's cool that it was yeah. like that. Yeah. It smells amazing. Yeah, yeah. you smell it all day. I know. It is like cooking spag pole. <laughs> there is a, like an earthy savouriness yeah. to it. It's like not a regular no. yeast no. smell, like a sweet no. smell that you would expect no. from a bakery or something. 
Cool. So, without, without making too much of a mess, would you would you want to do the honors or? Well, we? let's do it together. Let's do it together. Let's do it together. <sighs> Not that one. This one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, why you're here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one, that one goes upstairs. This one goes yeah, there. it's just the control. Yeah, yeah it's the control. control. Yeah, forget that. Yeah, okay. Cut. So, <laughs> so we're pitching this into, into there. there. Yeah. It's like we weren't listening. <laughs> right. I go. was confused. Yeah. Bob's away. probably keep that for the next the next run yeah so we're doing two mashes of the the bub yeah this is the second mash the guys are going in behind us and this is a hundred percent this is as we discussed a hundred percent chevalier malt so i thought it would be nice for us to, to try some of the malt you can feel it you can even feel when you run it in your hands there's a there's an oiliness to it that isn't mm. um yes there, there is like yeah, a, yeah, yeah. you feel it yeah. in your fingers, like yeah. there's a, it's not just dusty dry as you'd think it would be. Um, but some of that sweet sort of mm. creaminess is in yeah. there already. Absolutely. And then for the second uh, mash, we need we need more bubbles. So the, the bub is here. Okay. This is the boiled hops and wort, and we just need to add our starter yeast to it. So bash on, add the starter yeast to it. Should put this in there, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Like to <laughs> in there. There we go. Then we need an even distribution. Yeah, that's, that's the skill of Bobby. <laughs> there we go, and around. And then anti clockwise. <laughs> yeah. And so we're mashing in here just now. Mashing in takes about 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. We'll then do a mash rest for about 30 minutes. All that time, this will just be that's starting be to yeah. uh -huh. and go. And as soon as that happens, we'll just put it Pop in it. the line. Yep. Brilliant. And it'll be that quick. We're that quick. Amazing. We're that quick. So. Um, yeah, I didn't want to see that. Yeah, to see it yeah. start to go and, and be really active again. Mm. Cool. downstairs uh, for our 12 hour pitch so this recipe is different the book says there's a red there's the pitching of the start and that's with the bump that's the start of fermentation and then 12 hours later there is an addition of English ale yeast so as we described downstairs we've got a control one one without the bub in it um, and this is the the yeast for that this is the 12 hours later we matched that last night uh, that allowed us to prep the bump for this morning using that wort and uh, this is its addition for the for the yeast but if you look inside now you can see it's already going the wow. our starter fermentation is really kicked off that's amazing i mean that's so active yeah it's really really active and have you already used this combination already chevalier and ale yeast we've done a lot of work with chevalier the last couple of years uh-huh and we've not use this yeast with the Chevalier yet. So All right, well, well. It's, it's really good for us <laughs> to see what happens. You know, we do a lot of co-pitching of yeasts um, and we've done a lot of exploration of yeasts in the last year or so, but not this combination. So Love. in terms of a true heritage variety and a heritage yeast strain, really exciting for us. That's great, oh, that's really exciting, doubly exciting. Yeah. yeah. Good. Do the honors. Yeah. Do the, do, do the honors. <sighs> uh, yeah. Don't lose the bucket in there. No, that's probably, yeah, that's You got the bucket. I got the bucket. You do. My hand's got to start fermenting. Yeah. yeah. There you go. 
broom and motley. Now just go and, and we'll pick that up for the distillation at the end of the week. So that's it's really exciting for us. That's to, so exciting. You know, and there's yeah, a slightly yeah, different yeah. way for us to co-pitch too. Yeah. Normally we co-pitch a lot shorter, maybe between uh -huh. hours four and eight. Right. Not hours this is pretty 12. long. This is yeah. quite a long co-pitch. Yeah. So. I mean, okay, why do you think that was the case? But why can you read anything into that? No, I think, uh, well, it seems to be like it's the next day. Aye. Um, so whether it's because there was no temperature control or whether, you know, the pub just gets going and then they need to add a secondary one because they think the yeast is finishing with the pub and they need to top up, I'm not yeah. sure, but it's a long period of time yeah, for yeah, yeah. cold pitch. Uh, I'm really interested to see the results of this one against the ones we, we do oh. on other cool pitches as well. Yeah. Um, Interesting. When we get the analysis done of this, I'm sure it'll be really interesting for, yeah. for your viewers as well to see yeah, how, yeah, how yeah. it comes out. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So, um, the bob's in, in the fermenter, the controls, the yeast in for the control, so I guess it's time for us to go taste it. Brilliant. See Let's what yeah. Cool. Lovely. Um, right, so, this is the bob that we've made. So this is what Arthur and I worked on last night, and then what has been put downstairs this morning and cooled down. So this is without any yeast? Without any yeast on it, because otherwise we'd be, well, one drinking live yeast as much yeah. as we like Cascales. It's uh, the amount of yeast that goes into it significantly more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I thought it was the, probably the truest representative taste of, of what the bob tastes like, yeah. I guess. So take us through what was in this, because my teleportation didn't work last night. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is the first runnings of the control uh, mash, so it's 100% Chevalier malt, and then we pumped it up into the pilot still, and then we, uh, as per the the, the all season book, uh, 50, uh, we're looking at 55 litres. Uh, for the amount of size we have in our uh, fermenters downstairs, and then that had 1.3 kilos worth of hops in it. Um, and then that boils for 40 minutes. Um, and then, uh, according to the book, you meant to make that the night before, mm -hmm. so it cools down overnight, and this is it. Cooled down, Perfect. Cooled down overnight. I can't believe it exists. <laughs> I know. <laughs> We're talking about this for... Years. <laughs> it's alive. <laughs> Cheers. 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 And thank you for joining us on this yeah. crazy, crazy experiment. Oh. Hoppy. <laughs> this is like sweet and hoppy in them. Yeah. It's really spicy. Yeah, really mm. spicy. Bitter in the finish. Yeah, bitter. Very bitter. It's like roof of the mouth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whoa! <laughs> yeah. But the thick, bready sweetness mm. is yeah. amazing. And you get that kind of savoury thing already beginning to yeah. develop, you know. So it's, I mean, totally different, you know. So yeah. I've, I mean, not, I've never smelled or tasted anything like this. It's a brewery yeah. water, right? It's not, yeah. It's yeah. not a... It tastes like a healthful drink. <laughs> it yeah. yeah, yeah, it's kind of one of these health drinks that you... You, know, you don't necessarily want to drink, but you know it's going to do oh, you good. This is good for me. Yeah. This is good for me. A green juice. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much going on in there. There's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot, especially with that like first, the first sweetness that you taste, and you're like, oh, this is really sweet. And then the the hot just <laughs> 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 straight through the back of your mouth to hit that. Wow. But the, the texture. Yeah. To be, yeah. Talk about the texture. Yeah. Thick. Really, it's really yeah. silky. Yeah. And dense. Yeah. And that's something hugely that we, promising, you know. Yeah. Hugely, hugely promising. Something we get from Chevalier itself right. is that we get more texture from Chevalier um, than we do with Laureate or um, even Golden Promise. And we know it's in the distillery, we get, get more right. of that. So, um, really interesting to understand how thick the spirit was <laughs> uh, when it was being made with these you know really early land race and really early heritage style yeah. barleys that have more oils in them. Of course, I mean Chevalier being a classic example of that yeah. older style. Yeah. 
which we can't quite say was in use then, but was certainly in use a lot in the 19th century. Yeah, so from 1850s, Chevalier was like the, the booming, predominant variety across uh, all, of, all of England and southern Scotland. And then you get to other places where Scots Common's still about and there's some other bits and pieces. But really, um, Chevalier was the, the workhorse of the brewing and distilling sector all the way up until it's even mentioned in the in some of the conversations in the 1909 treaties of, yeah. of scotch whiskey yeah and um, so it's still prevalent yeah. all the way then and it, it's, it continues up until the 1920s and it's in its huge use yeah. mm -hmm. fantastic um, so while we couldn't get to the exact vaulted variety of that i think this is a, indicative of the yeah no absolutely. Time absolutely in that area yeah, yeah. Right. And so this bub, it's not, the, the, we have the control experiment, yeah. which is not using bub, and then this bub is used in proportion with the same wort that has been used in the control experiment. That's right, right yeah. yeah. And roughly speaking, that ratio of bub to wort in our... So uh, there's about 55 um, litres of bub goes into the recipe um, for, and then in the control that roughly equates about four and a half kilos, five kilos of yeast. Right. And in the control, we've just replicated that with the same amount of yeast, but with no bub. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the 55 liters of first runnings goes in with the five kilos of yeast goes in, but no hops addition. Yeah, Perfect. so although this is an incredibly hoppy liquid, that is effectively going to be diluted down to yeah so 55 55 liters i think ended up being once we boiled down about 50 liters of of um bub going in and it's a 5,000 liter fermenter so what's that what one percent yeah one okay. percent addition of of liquid mm -hmm. um so i'll be fascinated to see uh, what what that is i mean for example well, i think the really good example of this is that we use five kilos of yeast to generate all of our fermentation. And within those five kilos of yeast, we're using 1.3 kilos of hops. That's a if we look at it that way, that's a significant, that's mm -hmm. big. Yeah. significant weight, you know, it's over 20% of hops to yeast ratio. So I'd be really interested to yeah. see how that flavor develops from that. Especially with, with such concentrated yeah. flavor package that yeah. this is, you know. Yeah. Um, but seems, we saw downstairs like, like sure. how quick the yeast just, just yeah. you know, it's voracious on the bulb <laughs> uh, with it coming up the side yeah. and folding. So it'd be really interesting to see, you know, how that how that interacts with. The and that, so that then chimes with what the book says. I mean, the reason for using bulb, which is you can't always get yeast. The yeast might not always be good quality. Yeast is expensive. Yeah. Bulb is the option. Yeah. Because and then all of a sudden you, you see it working. You say, yeah, actually, you know, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. You know? And I and I think I'm not saying oh if you have the right equipment you could do it, but we did it in the still and and they created it and it and it wasn't a difficult thing to manufacture. Yeah. Realistically, it was it, it was what distilling has always been about, and that is uh, heat and time. You know, they, they heat up, they boiled it for forty minutes, they took it off, they let it cool. Uh, they had the hours prescribed on it, do it the night before, wake up in the morning, pitch it early. Everything is everything is heat and time. And so it's, uh, for us as a distillery, a very nice reflection on historic <laughs> distilling methods is still, it's still very like that in the world wow. spirit. It's so amazing that McDonald, he did actually leave not just a vague description, but a recipe that the guys are you. I mean, it is a recipe, yeah. it's time. Yeah with the quantities so you can scale it up and the, the, you know the, the thing that fascinates me about that arthur is that that then infers that the practice of bub making was much older than that what he's done is actually refine it so that there is now a, almost like a standardized recipe mm -hmm. so so the, the idea of bubbing is much older than this book you know that's not it starting that that is it being codified in, in a way it would be really interesting to see when the practice actually stopped as well because there's because we've just got this one little snapshot in time where bub is a thing and it's yeah. obviously a very common thing because it talks about this is how you do it it says it's quite common 
but we don't have anything past that saying, oh, we're 10 kilos above or 15 kilos above in a recipe. So it'd be really interesting to see when that actual practice finished. Yeah, it's that transition period when, when the term is, continues, but the term is used for a slightly different yeah. way of, of, of the process. You know, so. Yeah, we'll find it because we are antiquarians. That's yeah. our job. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. I'll leave that to you guys of hunting down other people being like, when did you last as well? We are, don't you worry. must have a note. You must have a note somewhere because they must. They there, there, there'll be something. Meticulous yeah. records. Yeah. You know, I, I work, when I worked at Krabby's, that those archives have meticulous records of everything that went into everything. The quality of these products, while we always think of as the health and safety and the hygiene probably not as good, the record keeping is is just as good as it is now. It's exceptional with the amount of the amounts that went in, the time that went in, and how things are recorded. So, I've be there. no doubt that when this goes out, people will start getting in touch. Be really interested because yeah. yeah. they always do. Yeah. You know? Is that have you That's found, joy. Yeah, 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 yeah. On, on this one, you know. I mean, we always leave it open, open ended, because we're not saying right. That's the end of that story. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like. There are questions. There are always questions at, at the end of every every ev episode. Like, we don't know why this happened or what happened next or, or whatever. And there are always people coming in, going, "Ah, I remember this. And you, you look here, look there." So, you know, it's, it's a living, organic yeah. process, you know, which is why it's fascinating. I suppose know? that is a reflection of how whiskey's changed over the years, anyway. Right? It is organically yeah. changing. Yeah. There's a really interesting bit in the book on, like the eight steps on how to make really good whiskey uh, that I have printed out and stuck in my office. <laughs> and some of them are like, use butter. <laughs> things. But there's other bits in it like, don't over pitch yeast. If you can split your runs, there's some really nice things on it that really, you know. Which chime true to you now? Which I think have slowly, some of them have slowly been forgotten over time because mm back in these days there was no science behind it it was just like some guy collating opinions <laughs> uh, and uh, or, or the or how distilleries operated but there wasn't any science behind it now we have pitch rates and we know what pitch rates we should be using for certain yeasts whereas that one is just very specific don't over pitch your yeast <laughs> uh, because to make good whiskey you don't need you just trying to get as little yeast in there as possible uh -huh. um, so there's some really interesting there's really interesting eight point bulletin on <laughs> what, is the, yeah. what is the best way to make whiskey? Tell yeah. me next time we can use butter, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the French cookery approach. Yeah, it. yeah. It's good, but have you tried it with butter? <laughs> <laughs> Just a little How much? Just yeah. more, more, so, more, salted, more. unsalted. Yeah. You know, that's it. There are questions. There is. There is. You know, it's it's one of these old, not wives' tales, but one that I've heard quite a lot propagated about butter and, yeah. and instead of antifold. Right. Um, hog fat. As well. um, but it's really interesting to see it. You know, fairy liquid hog fat. You yeah. know, all these things used to be a thing. It's very interesting now to to see these written down. And, and thank you for letting me look at the book. Uh, my pleasure. Good. It's great to have. Well, obviously, you're going to be around here with us uh, making this. But for me, you're around the distilleries a lot more, and I'm looking at everything and going, "Is that normal? Is that different <laughs> to how when you normally do it?" I mean, I can tell that's not normal. That's not, not normal. normal. Yeah, that's not normal. <laughs> that's one of the weirdest things I've ever tasted. <laughs> <laughs> but downstairs to see how hard it was going straight away. Yeah, yeah. that's. Yeah, I think it definitely. We try and pitch the yeast in a in a sensible place so that it's not stressed immediately by the first runnings. Mm -hmm. um, so the sugars aren't too high. Uh, however, in seeing that doesn't seem to be an issue. Well, you know, we've concentrated that, we've boiled that for 40 minutes. It doesn't seem to be an issue with the yeast. It just picked it up and just went for it. And, yeah. and it was rising up the side of the, of the drum so fast. And I think, you know, for us, that's not normal. And it's exciting. It's yeah. exciting. Genuinely oh. exciting. I'm really right. excited to see what the this looks like. Yeah. So, um, we'll have to have some discussion about cut points. Because one of the weird things in that in that in the book itself is that it's quite an open ended question itself is cut points for the distiller. Yeah, they're really mm. specific about lots, lots of, of things, things, but not yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so I'll be interested to sit with you guys and figure out yeah. like where you would like to go uh, with that. And you know, explore and what where the hops are coming, you know, if they're yeah. going on early, late, and yeah. you know, we'll look at some data for hop distillates or something yeah. and see see when they come in a run and then we'll make a decision on where the cut points are going to be with it. 
I suppose you know, maybe the reason for that is you know the cut points are perhaps more intuitive. And, yeah. You know, you know, depending on the distillery, so you can't really set it. You know. Yeah. It's kind of well, you know, that's that's just the way that you're running your still. Therefore, it's going to be coming that's in true. at this strength, and this is the flavour you want. So you know, right, you know so right. that can so be left open. You know. Everything was shoveled, right? So they talk yeah. very openly in that about you want a low flame but a high heat and how shoveling was done and everything so i guess it's completely dependent on your stokers <laughs> and their their skill in, yeah. in how fast you're running so you're probably right it's very intuitive yeah. and although they could measure alcohol there's an inaccuracy as well at that point not there's been. also probably a closeness at that point but they, because they would measure alcohol and probably in the vat yeah rather yeah. than it's safe yeah. Um, but they'll be so tasting there'll be, so, va yeah, there'll be yeah, vatting records yeah. probably and, and if we had the amount of bushels that went into a mash then we could probably work our way back into the percentage of that came out of the vat rather than cut points itself so I guess we'll just wait a couple of days and then we'll, yeah. do the, we'll do the distillation and see what comes across yeah mm -hmm. perfect well, can't wait for that thank you <laughs> uh, so we've just taken some spirit um, out of the safe, uh, we're just giving it a nose, see what it's like, and, and it's, uh, it's at full strength, right? So just be careful. <laughs> sure, sure. And this, is, we've been tasting it as it's gone along, and this is towards the end of the run. Yeah. The, the heart of the run. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot closer to the right, to the, the tails cut, which, which we'll do in a second. Great. And it is immediately herbal? Yeah. Unusually herbal? Unusually herbal. Not vegetal, but herbal, like brighter, greener. There's a little creaminess to it, but we get that from Chevalier in general, which is nice. And as it's later in the cut, there's a lot more of the cereal character coming through as well. Yeah. Compared to earlier, when there were all the fruits charging over. Yeah, a little bitterness and fruits right at the start. Mm -hmm. It's got a real bitterness right in the middle of the palate, which I think is really interesting. Whoa. It's kind of zingy as well. It is zingy. It kind of like, it's right through the middle of your tongue and around the sides, it's weird. And chemically, would you expect the hoppy character to come over earlier or later or you had no idea or I'm just I, doing some research some rudimentary research i think we expect it to come over kind of different some different places i think for us it's really interesting because of the star still shape and with the purifier that um it could slightly change over time so i think uh, for us i was kind of expecting it the lower half of the run but i think we got like the bitterness at the top half of the run and i feel like we're getting the herbal now at the lower half of the run mm. I think that's just interacting with the, the Chevalier as well. Mm. Seems good to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a really nice surprise. I yeah. In the back of my head, I almost was expecting to make something super weird. But yeah. I know. It kind of has like, um, it, it tastes like new make spirit. Yeah. But it has sure. this odd thing that sort of runs through the middle of it and, and affects the mouthfeel a little bit that's slightly different. So... Interesting, um, really interesting. I'm so happy. I'm so, so happy. Cool. Bud spirit, that's cheers. what that tastes like. Yeah, cheers. There we go. Done. Done. <laughs> Today is a really great day that we waited for for some time. Uh, we have a bubbed spirit running through the stills and throughout the process we've done everything we can to match the recipe to the original John McDonald book and we have also made a control and then also a bub spirit so the control matches as best we can the recipe in McDonald's book but then also we've made a bub spirit as well and throughout those process throughout the process we've Tried to keep everything the same with the control and the bub spirit mark. Yeah. Yeah, so just a really nice side by side comparison. Even in the distillery, we've run the wash still the same, 
and we've run the spirit still the same and we've kept the same cut points and then that way the two spirits side by side will see the differences using the bulb great and fermentation same yeast used effectively same yeast used roughly same, the same fermentation time roughly the same fermentation time the bulb spirit got slightly longer um but yeah yeah everything else try to keep that try to keep that same Okay, and crucially, this would have been all a massive waste of time <laughs> if they had tasted exactly the same. But yeah, but uh, like early indications out of the safe is that there is like a really big difference between the two of them, and the the bitterness, I guess, of the hops really shines through in the spirit, and that's that's really exciting that we get to change the way that spirit is manufactured. Yeah, so we weren't really sure if the quantity of hops were going to show through in the wash but trying the wash as i was excitedly popping in and out of the distillery on the way to work the wash absolutely had this yeah. kind of like a kind of hoppy car scale kind of vibe to yeah. it and then there was another doubt whether that hoppy character would carry over into the distillation but i think we're really optimistic yeah i think so well, we know. You know. Well, yeah, we know. We know there is, it's come through in the spirit and it's really exciting. And I'm really excited to see what happens next with the next bit of it. Uh, you know, I'll see what happens after some aging and some maturation and stuff. Yeah. Um, and doubly good, it doesn't seem to taste disgusting either. No, yeah, that's a bonus, I guess. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a different spirit that you've yeah. never had running through these stills before. Yeah. And it also seems promising as well. Yeah, exactly. I think the interesting stuff for us is we've, we know that this is finished or will be finishing very shortly is the clean down that we have to go to put all the stills back yeah, to of course. what they need to do. So Sorry about that. It's yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> but it's all right. We have to fully clean them once a year anyway, so now is the perfect time to do it. So. Okay. Yeah. Because we have the remnants, yeah. the, the, the tails effectively, yeah. um, and the residue from the bub spirit, which includes hops, you have to make legal whiskey yeah. in the future so yeah, exactly. you can't have any of that remnant contaminating in the yeah. future so we've got to rinse them all down we've got to clean out the wash still fully and then we'll rinse down the spirit still um and give it a give it a blast on the plates and everything and give it a boil through make sure it's all clear through and then it will be reset to whiskey on wednesday well dave and i are really grateful for letting us interrupt the making of normal whiskey <laughs> and uh yeah thank you for all your efforts Thank you. Thanks for uh, entrusting us with the, the book and with, uh, with, with the recipe. Cool. Great. Great. Cheers, Arthur. Yeah. We've teleported back in. We're oh. ready to taste, Bob. Um, it's been a few months since you've made it. I noticed you've got some Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe wardrobe in the background. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, that's what the teleportation system ah, yeah. ah, if, one, if one system doesn't work then uh transportation cabinet does you know the so. wooden tardis we've got two things to taste and that's the bub product control that's the bub yeah that's the bub should we start with the control yes 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 i, I always like a bit of control 60 <laughs> percent. are you tasting under loot first i am yes yes i have water uh ready for this but uh it's wonderful you know th there's a real sweetness to it uh i think this is it's a gorgeous new mini it really is it really really is and of course tasting new make spirit or totally unaged whiskey or spirit that will turn into whiskey is maybe a bit unusual to for most people but of course, in the 1830s, not much of this whiskey would have touched wood before oh. 20th century legislation that insisted on it being aged for two and then three years. I mean, but, but possibly, you know, as long as it took to get into market and if it was in a, in a pub or, you know, in a grocer shop or whatever, you know, it would be in cast, but it wouldn't necessarily be deliberately matured and then sold as matured spirits. So. No, in transit and on the gantry was the only kind of maturation. There we are. A much better way of saying it. But it's a, it's a lovely sweetness to this, and then the, the sense of kind of that slight oily quality to it. You know, there's a, it smells thick. You know? 
we actually got the chance to taste, I remember now, quite a lot of new make spirits made by Holyrood Good. using different barley types. And I, I wasn't sceptical, but I was sure. much more impressed than I expected to be by the difference in barley. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I think once you do taste them side by side, you, you can really see that, you know, the barley does make a difference. Uh, yeah. I've done a few of these over, over the years now. And, yeah, I mean, like you initially, I was fairly sceptical. I thought, well, you know, the difference will be, if there is a difference, it'll be, you know, minimal and after maturation you won't be able to notice it. But the difference can be absolutely significant. Sometimes in terms of aroma, uh, and quite often in terms of, in terms of that kind of thicker flavour, you know that that heavier heavier textural quality, which you get very much so for, from the Chevalier here. Yeah, and I don't remember the ones I was less impressed by, but I do remember the two that I was really impressed by, and that was Chevalier, which we have here, so an, an older type of barley, and also Golden Promise. Yeah. Which, um, when I started drinking whiskey, there were a few distilleries that. Um, Claim they, they specified Golden Promise and it was very good whiskey. But yeah. this Chevalier and smelling it out of the bag and tasting it out of the bag, yeah. impressive stuff. They're doing really, really good things at Holyrood, even irrespective of this weird bud thing. Yeah, it's, yeah, I, I would agree. You know, I, I, I love distillers who ask the questions, what if, you know, and if it works, that's great. If it doesn't work, well, at least we know. And, and it's kind of moving this idea of what it's, what it can do forward. Especially these days, where, where you've got what 140 from 140 plus distilleries in Scotland and a lot of new ones uh, starting up, you have to find a way to cut through. You have to find a quality way in, in which to cut through. And one way in which you can do this is by asking these questions. You know, what can we do in terms of flavour? And that will come down to yeast. That will come down to barley variety. It will come down to smoking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you know, for any new distiller to survive uh, in incredibly tough uh fascinating exciting for us you know it's a retail and the writer you know this is a brilliant time for a distiller you have to find the, the, these quality options uh and i do agree you know having gone around holidays a few times now the thinking uh of mark and nick and the team is just absolutely fantastic there's never been more to sell and more to write about i said dave <laughs> well no i mean I, i'm working on uh the next edition of the atlas <laughs> at the moment which is a complete rewrite for it's been nine years since since the last atlas came out you know there's 250 distilleries making whiskey in australia <laughs> yeah anyway yeah this is good. you know uh, yeah. wonderful fruit wonderful sweetness not the one that just really big oily rich character coming through really good this kind of plummy and slightly kind of heavy floral thing kind of that comes through on on the finish, kind of you know, lilac-y, violety quality. Just not, not Palmer violets, but actually you know that that kind of violet root. Very long, dark, dark character on on the very very back part, mm -hmm. and that's without water. You know, I, I'm quite happily sipping this as at sixty percent. I'm already with a wee bit of water and that lilac-y floral character is really coming out. It's not really that serially, I would say. <laughs> it's almost a contradiction to talk about feeling the barley, feeling the malt, but it's not in the sense of overly Weetabixy kind of character <laughs> or, or that you can quite often get when you make, especially when you add a bit of water when you dilute. You, you can often get that kind of clean hamster cage kind of... You know. <laughs> <laughs> You're hoping for a clean one anyway. Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, that's quite a difference. So superb, massive promise. Um, can't wait to see what that turns into in its own right. You ready to try the bug? Uh, so. I mean, it, it's quite a moment, this bit, because I remember, you know, when you phoned me up years and years and years ago, you know, before my beard was grey, <laughs> this was the very first thing that you talked about. You know, I've got this idea. Have you ever heard about Bob? Uh, and that, I mean, is how all of this this madness started. And you know, this is just a it's quite an emotional moment, actually, Arthur. I think yeah. it's been a slog. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do a, a straight comparison here, actually. The joy is that it's different. It's also immediately on the nose. It is exceptionally good. 
I've moved past the relief that it is different, and now I'm feeling joyous about it. I'm in a period of joy that it is different. Um, but it, initially, it was a relief because it was a huge leap of faith from yeah. Nick and, and Mark to allow us to um, do two complete runs in yeah. not a tiny distillery. <laughs> um, Especially buggering up their entire production, you know. Yeah. So, you know. But this this is brighter somehow. It's yeah, sort of citric element coming through. The word I came up with was zingy. There was a mm. zinginess to it that yeah. seemed to leap out of the glass. The control <clears throat> had that with that weight and that fruit and that power immediately apparent. You know, as soon as you put your nose in the glass when it was neat. Here, you're absolutely right. It, it's got that that freshness, that vibrancy that touch of citrus, you, you feel there's some more acidity coming through on this. And if we're going to talk more specifically about the fruits, it was probably largely the same in that one, but I'm thinking black currant or blackberry. Dark fruit, plummy kind of, yeah, that, I mean, that kind of black currant thing as well. Uh, you've still got that in the palate. It's coming through, but the delivery is, is very different. The finish is very different because for me, on the control, the finish just gets dark and it goes very, very deep. Uh, and this, that acidity and that brightness and that slight spice and the kind of slight more drying character just comes through in the finish. Uh, they're both fascinating. Uh, I find the bulb probably slightly more fascinating to be, to be perfectly honest. I think there's more going on. It's hard because obviously with tasting, you, you, there's preconceived ideas in your mind if you know what it's made of and things like that but is there a bit of slightly dank herbal character along with that late spice i I, 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 I'm not, I wouldn't say it was dank but, but I, I would certainly say there's there's some of that kind of herbal quality almost kind of tarragony uh, kind of slight quality coming through on it you know spring woods it leaps about on the tongue you know, the control kind of flows in and it's thick and it's oily and it's boom, you know, it's in there. This really dances in the tongue. Uh, you know, I haven't added any, added any water yet, but it's much more, much more exciting. Uh, there seems to be more energy to it. I mean, I'm quite interested in the energy of whiskey these days. Uh, mm. You know, that it's kind of energy transfer you get, you know, driven, driven by alcohol. Uh, and this just has, I, I think, just that, that touch more energy to it. And the mince has gone. The mince has gone, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting, you know, now that I've added water to it, uh, you do get a slight change. You get more of that kind of Chevalier oiliness coming through in, on, in the beginning and the middle of the tongue. And almost at that finish, there's a more, there's a clearer division between that. So kind of the Chevalier character is kind of, you know, pulling things apart and actually adding the, this, this central core, the, this rich central core. And then, boom, it suddenly it takes off uh, more dramatically than the finish. Uh, yeah, fascinating. But it's not it's not madly different. It's not recognisably not whiskey new make spirit. It's still within that same framework. We've not made something totally outside the box, totally unusual. No, 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 no. I think it's a very cool. It's a great quality spirit, and it'll age magnificently. And it will. It would, uh, if the SWA allow it, fall fall quite 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 legitimately in, into, uh, into into the into the whiskey category. You know, I've tried quite a, quite a few kind of hoppy whiskies. You know, uh, and they're pretty tough, tough to drink. You know, yeah. so, you know, it's just you know, hops just don't really seem to work. Kind of get in the way. So, where were they? California, there was one. Yeah, 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 yeah. American, American ones, and you know, which were you know probably from those fairly extreme hops that they were growing out there, Cascade and, and everything. Yeah, and it just came through. You know, the 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 the, the resulting spirit was just incredibly aggressive, uh, and this is this is remarkably subtle. You wouldn't really you, you know that there's something different, but it's not hoppy. <laughs> no. you know, no. you know what I mean? Well, you're much more experienced tasting new make spirits. I've tried plenty, but in my past experience, I've sometimes been bewildered because mm. you're tasting this drink that is made to turn into something else. Glendronach, a, a whiskey that I love, 
the new make spirit's pretty filthy. Um, <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it, yeah, but it's it, it, as a drink in itself, it's bordering on horrible, but it turns into something magnificent. I'm sure that'll be one of the first questions. Is it being aged? Yes, mm -hmm. um, it is being aged. What's going to happen to it? Don't know. What's going to happen to this bub spirit as it develops? Are oh, different? Are the elements that have come over the stills from the hops? Is that going to become more apparent, less apparent? It's, it's not. It's not so obvious that the wood starts to cover up these things. So it, 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 flavors can be revealed as well as mm -hmm. covered up by maturation. If there's an aroma in there at New Make, which seems to be quite fragile. You know, it, and it's quite volatile and it flies off quite quickly. Yeah. It's going to fly off quite quickly during maturation. You know, that, that's the sort of thing that's going to disappear naturally, you know, in, in, in the cask. And also the cask is perhaps going to suppress it uh, to a certain extent. Purely hypothetical, but I think there's enough weight here. And I think there's an integration of flavour already in place. And the flavours are quite bold, which means that they will stand up to maturation. I think relaxed maturation and refill will, will, will give you an idea of how these flavors begin to develop i'd quite like to see something bottled around too after refill wood if we assume hopped bubbed spirit was being made then um we can imagine it being put in a cask shipped to europe sitting yeah. in a pub somewhere on the gantry mm -hmm. and that little bit of maturation time and that's historically valid mm -hmm. and not breaking any laws yeah, um, and, and, you know, uh, having the pub bub, uh, I think, is, is a great idea. <laughs> it never grows old, saying the word. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think my one, <laughs> my one regret about the project was maybe that we didn't use fuggle hops because fuggle bub. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I think the the joy of this, Arthur, is that that uh, without any degree of smugness on on, on our parts. It has worked. Uh, I think it has revealed an area of whiskey and whiskey production which has been unknown. I think there was, there was the, the intriguing reasons why Bob was used uh, have been revealed. The fact it was a very, it was an old practice that was then carried through for an extremely long time. It was part and parcel of how whiskey was made for, for, for valid reasons. So it's great to have it back. And I don't see any reason why it can't be continued to be made. So perhaps we will have the fuddle bar. We can but dream. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how other distillers react and if, if anyone is interested in, in, in carrying this on. You know, there, there will be legal, you know, as quite rightly, you know, I think there will be legal investigations uh, into this. You know, it was standard practice. You know, we, we can prove it was tradition. So, so therefore there's, there's something uh, in the advantage of it. I don't think this will be the end. When I was tasting it with the Royal Mile guys, um, I got a few WhatsApps afterwards from people saying, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I, I much preferred the control. I, there was something about the bub spirit that I didn't like, and they were almost apologizing to me. And I was saying, thanks for the feedback. And they were like, I'm sorry though. That's not the point. That's not the starting point really for this. The recipe existed. I wanted to know what it tasted like. I wanted it to exist again. And whether it's good or bad doesn't really matter to me so much. I'm delighted it's not disgusting. I'm thrilled it's interesting. And I'm really optimistic about what a bit of time and wood will do. And, um, and it just feels like a great achievement of ours, of Mark's, of, of, yeah. of, um, of the rest to uh, Hollywood to have no, made I, it I, again. Yeah. I, I think it's more than interesting. Interesting is one of those words that that, that writers use to be polite and saying something shit. Uh, <laughs> this is more than interesting. This is good. This is really good spirit. Uh, but 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 you're absolutely right. You know, if you know, some people might prefer the control. Some people might prefer the bulk. But you know, the fact is, it works. It's balanced. It's complex. It's fascinating. Uh, it's up to you, but you know whether it's you know a range of flavors that, that you you like or not. Uh, but it is a valid, valid experiment that has revealed amazing stuff about whiskey. Yeah. Well, actually, I don't mentioned it yet. These are products. Um, oh. So. <laughs>
Holyrood have bottled up a number of um, uh, these bottles and also in small 10 CLs as well that you can buy as a pair, but also the 50 CLs as well. So they're going to be on sale. Let me check my notes. No, oh, yeah, Royal Mile Whiskies. Um, the, um, a fine retailer. Yeah, yeah they're, they're all right. And um, I think elsewhere um, in due course as well, possibly, I think some's going to be exported by Hollywood around the world as well. So, um, And then the rest will be left in cask um, to work a bit of magic, which one hopes. You too can try Bob. Yeah. Thanks so much, Dave. It's been such fun doing this one. <laughs> whatever next, Arthur, whatever next. Something more simple, I hope. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and something sooner as well. Yes. See you then. Ciao.